Sí, sí, la estoy entendiendo. Sí, ¿Están no, no. entendidos? Yes. ¿Están entendidos? ¿Están entendidos en inglés? Well, thank you very much, Aníbal, for, the, for participating. Welcome, everybody, to this session of the Team Coffee Talks. Today, we have with us a PhD candidate, Aníbal Moncada, uh, within the framework of the Severo Ochoa Team Coffee Talks. And, well, he's going to deliver us, uh, for sure, insightful uh, presentation about the numerical modeling of in-soil environmental conditions and long-term performance of polymeric reinforced Soil walls. So, thank you for participation. For participating, the floor is yours, Anil. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, everyone, for coming and attending online. Um, okay, so to begin our presentation, I'll briefly talk about what are reinforced soil walls, um, what are they used for, and how they work. Within within that frame, we'll talk about our objectives and motivations of, of my thesis. Uh, Later, I'll talk about the theory of hydraulic numerical modeling of the in soil conditions within reinforced soil walls. And third and last, I'll talk about briefly about the numerical modeling of the long term response of polymeric reinforcements. So, reinforced soil walls are a proven solution that's been used in the industry for years. This is a sustainable and safe solution using various geotechnical applications, including um, Bridge abutments, highway embankments, uh, retaining structures, and other type of geotechnical solutions. And is composed of two principal materials. One is the compacted soil material, and the second one are the reinforcement layers. These reinforcement layers can be continuous or discontinuous uh, horizontal layers that are embedded within uh, compacted high high quality granular material. These reinforcements can be of extensible nature or polymeric or inextensible nature or metallic. This extensible or inextensible definition is with respect to the extensibility of the reinforcement with respect to the soil. So for reinforcements, we can have strip elements like the uh, superior picture. Or we can have, for example, ladder elements, which are made of steel in the bottom picture. Uh, these reinforcements, besides being uh, polymeric or steel, can be of different configurations in strips, in ladders, uh, in grids, or in mats. So our focus is on extensible reinforcements, that is, polymeric reinforcements. And due to their extensible nature, uh, common design practice is based on the active earth pressure theory. There are several methods to calculate the uh, required loads of each reinforcement layer. And in the newly proposed uh, European design standard, now besides using analytical and empirical theoretical methods, uh, it, it will be allowed to use numerical tools as a primary design methodology. As I said before, these type of structures are commonly used in the geotechnical solution, as geotechnical solutions. And you can probably recognize these geometries from the th first and third picture, uh, which are commonly implied as bridge abutments or as highway passes, overpasses. But there's also other applications in the mining industry or port industry in which the wall can be, for example, partially submerged. So as I told you, there are several design methodologies depending on the reinforcement type and the structure characteristics. And these different methodologies will yield uh, different reinforcement requirements. Reinforcements are usually characterized by an ultimate tensile strength value, value for example, uh, 30 kilonewtons, which then translates into a grade. If it has 30 something kilonewtons, it's grade 30, so on and so forth with 40, 50, etc. So we can see that for three different uh, design methodologies, be the stiffness, the simplified, and the coherent gravity method. Uh, for an idealized wall, we have three considerably different uh, requirements. In one requirement, we have uh, we have in which all layers are the same grade of grade 25, and on the other hand, for example, in grades uh, arrangement C, we have uh, several different layers of several different grades. 
A downside of analytical methods is that they don't incorporate um, the, the permissional response of the structure. And they, there are several assumptions, for example, a steep foundation that are made in order to simplify all the calculations. Um, this brings uh, into account the numerical tools that allow, allows, allows us to model all these scenarios and analyze the, uh, the results. To model reinforced soil walls, we have to account for every uh, structural component within this wall. It's, it's a complex uh, multi-material uh, structure. We have different soils that could be the same, could be different, depends on the conditions. We have the facing elements, we have the uh, supports of each facing element, we have the reinforcement layers, and we also have uh, one of the most relevant aspects that are the interface, be it between the soil and the facing elements or the soil and the reinforcement layers. Right? In this case, we are using CodeBright in which we can use uh, continuum interface layers, uh, which have proven to have a, a equally good response as uh, non-zero uh, thickness elements in, in other finite element or finite difference programs. With this, as I previously said, we can analyze the deformational behavior, uh, observing upward horizontal displacements to see if we are within service conditions, observe uh, shear strengths within the soil to see how far or how close we are from failure, and we can also do uh, stress analysis. In this figure, for example, we can see the maximum uh, stress at each reinforcement layer. In this case, we use the three configurations that I show in the table, uh, the previous slide. So uh, again, within the framework of polymeric materials, this type of materials have a strength and a stiffness that is rate dependent. This means that their mechanical response will vary with temperature, with time, and with the applied load. Also, polymeric materials uh, present, depending on the material, more or less creep. Creep is the long-term deformation over time uh, under constant load, which uh, can have uh, serious consequences over the structure within the, its, its life cycle. And in the case, for example, of polyester, which is our, our focus, uh, we have uh, hydrolysis, which is the degradation of the material when in contact with uh, water molecules, be it vapor or uh, liquid. All of these components are usually incorporated at the design phase by partial factors in a commonly consensus as an over conservative way. Um, reinforcement that have uh, their ultimate tensile strength is reduced into approximately 30 to 40% for an allowable strength when designing, which is a considerable reduction. So in the framework of, of my thesis, our objective is to model the long-term serviceability behavior of reinforced soil walls, accounting for thermal, hydraulic, and mechanical conditions. With this in mind, today I'll talk on two specific topics, which are the thermohydraulic uh, response of reinforced soil walls, and the modeling of the long-term response of pet strap reinforcement. On to the first topic of the thermohydraulic response. There is uh, ample evidence in the literature of the thermal response of two exposed phases structures. This differs from, say, an infinite one-surface structure in, in, in the sense that we have two contours that um, incorporate the boundary conditions. Um, and as with temperature, changes in atmospheric, atmospheric condition will change uh, the insole distribution in time and in space of temperature, relative humidity, and in hand, uh, degree of saturation. Most of the literature just focus on the temperature uh, distributions and ignore the, the changes in degree of saturation by using either a dry medium or a completely saturated medium. As we'll see with some results, uh, this is not the case in, in many scenarios. For the following results, we've implemented a 15 meter high wall. This 15 meter high wall is rather large, rather tall when considering real structures, but we wanted to see the, the spatial distribution of temperature and, and saturation degree uh, on a, a wider domain. 
For this wall, we incorporated uh, boundary conditions of temperature, relative humidity via liquid pressure, and uh, rain or precipitation on the three superior contours. Uh, this mesh domain shows a uh, homogeneous uh, soil mass, which we analyzed. And uh, before doing all the uh, precise analysis, we actually did a mesh sensitivity with different types and size of elements and reached uh, the base case scenario, which we chose based on uh, computational time and on the required resolution of the results. We also consider uh, different cases, including, uh, for example, uh, variable water table scenarios, or a scenario in which the reinforced soil zone is uh, isolated with uh, drain layers or with impermeable layers. Regarding the boundary conditions, we've used uh, daily records for periods of five years for three different climates, four different climates. That is Mediterranean, desert, tropical and continental, which in this case uh, represent the cities of Barcelona, Abu Dhabi, Singapore, and Toronto. These records are of temperature, relative humidity, and of precipitations, again, daily for periods of five years. So on to some results. Uh, all the results will correspond to the highlighted, in this case, red zone of the upper right image. So in this case, I'm showing you the mean temperature of the reinforced soil after a five-year period, uh, excluding the results from the first two years. This is because we consider that the first two years are the uh, a period in which the uh, equilibrium conditions are reached uh, uh, based on the, on the initial conditions that we, we used. So first, what calls the attention is that there's a clear gradient from the top in, with increased depth, and this is attributed to the soil, uh, to the rain infiltration. And uh, it's even lower towards the top due to uh, water evaporation. So when water infiltrates or evaporates, it takes away heat and reduces the temperature. And then what we found out in here, uh, in agreement with previous research, is that the, the soil, the mean soil temperature can be approximated to the mean average yearly temperature for each geographic location. So that is uh, approximately 17 to 16 degrees for Barcelona, around 29 to 30 degrees for Abu Dhabi, around 27 for Singapore, and approximately 8 degrees for Toronto. On to some other results, we have the degree of saturation and relative humidity of the soil mass with the uh, described boundary conditions. Before going into a little detail, I'd like to show you this formula which relates the degree of saturation with the relative humidity using a water retention curve and a psychromatic law. From this formula, we can tell that for any non-zero value of saturation, we'll have constant values of 100% relative humidity. And for any values of relative humidity under 100%, we'll have 0% of saturation, which is a, a, a concept that it usually gets mixed up humidity with saturation. So regarding degree of saturation, we can see that for three of the four cases, we have a mean value of around 10% throughout the structure, which is a little bit lower towards the, the exposed contours. And this value turns out to be a constant mean value of 100% throughout the soil mass. Um, so again, if we go back to this equation, this, this is uh, coherent, it's to be expected. On the case of the desert location, we have scarce rain events in wheels with uh, low with low intensity. So there's little to no water infiltration, meaning mean saturation values of zero percent, which uh, result in variable relative humidity values of around sixty percent to one hundred percent, depending on the on the depth. Okay, so the past results, I show you the comparison between the four uh, analyzed boundary conditions. Now I'll just switch my focus to one of the boundary conditions, in this case, the Mediterranean climate. Um, here I'm showing you the mean temperature for a five-year analysis, excluding the first two years, for the three water table scenarios, and on the fourth picture, 
figure for the isolated soil mass scenario. From the first two figures, we can deduce that the uh, soil temperature doesn't change uh, noticeably with an increased uh, water table scenario, water, water table. In this case, the water table is imposed as a bottom pressure with a fixed temperature. On the third scenario, we can see a clear increment in, in soil temperature, but this increment matches with the water flux that is imposed on the right contour with the same fixed temperature as the first two scenarios. So in this case, even though the temperature is increased, that's attributed to the water flux temperature, which if needed be, could be higher or lower to represent the actual conditions. On the fourth uh, figure, we can see a slight increment uh, of the temperatures towards the facing, and this is attributed to the lack of rain infiltration. This increment is around of, uh, uh, one degree Celsius, so uh, even though it's uh, observable, it's not deemed significant. When we go to the saturation degree and relative humidity results, we can see a few different things. First, we consider a uh, high quality granular sandy soil uh, as common design guidelines uh, specify, which has no fine content. Um, consequently, the, there is no capital, capillary rise to be expected, which means that the water or the saturation level will be towards the water table, as we can see on these four superior figures. Um, this, uh, this scenario matches the figures I've previously shown of the, comparing the four atmospheric conditions. And we can see again that increasing the uh, water table doesn't really modify the saturation level of the soil mass due to this lack of capillary rise. But if we isolate the soil mass with uh, drains or impermeable layers, there's a clear decrease of the saturation level from around 10% to an almost constant 0%, which if we go to relative humidity, changes from a constant 100% in all cases to a variable from a value from around 70% to 100%. If we want to analyze more in depth the temperature distribution within the, the reinforced soil mass, uh, we can see, we can extract uh, temperature profiles at different distances of the contours uh, throughout time. From this, we can tell right away that most temperature variations occur within the, two, the first two to three meters of distance uh, to the exposed contours. This distance may vary if we are uh, observing temperature from the vertical contour or the horizontal superior contour um, due to the, the material that's exposed to the boundary condition. In, this can be seen more in depth in the rightmost image when comparing these two images in which um, the, con the concrete facing acts as an isolating layer equal to approximately one to two meters of soil. So uh, variations at three meters of soil will be almost equal to variation at one meter from the facing with concrete. Uh, after a depth of approximately uh, four to five meters, this or distance from the contour of approximately four to five meters, these oscillations are reduced and the soil temperature tends to a somewhat constant value, which again matches or is close to the mean average yearly mean atmospheric value for each location. If we analyze one of those profiles, but now looking at the degree of saturation, we can see what I said at the start that for the first approximately 500 years to 600 or 500 days or 600 days, which is two years approximately, um, there's a change from the initial uh, conditions into an, an equilibrium of the system, considering the boundary conditions for each location. Uh, we can see that for, again, after two years, for every depth, we have a, a degree of saturation of approximately 5% to 40%. This, again, equates into a relative humidity of 100%. Now, why are we emphasizing relative humidity so much? This is because, as I said, polyester suffers from degradation due to hydrolysis, 
which is when the polyester fibers come in contact with water, they degrade. And most often, all laboratory experiments are measured with inner samples, meaning that they are at a relative humidity of the exposed room of the laboratory. That's 60% or 70%. While in the soil, we have relative humidity values depending on the condition, but could be up to 100% constant throughout the life of the system, meaning that laboratory conditions may not be uh, representative of what uh, the, the actual conditions are in the structure. Finally, we did a sensitivity analysis over thermal and hydraulic parameters for each soil. And uh, we find out that mostly all variations come when varying uh, hydraulic parameters. That is, thermal parameters don't have a significant uh, impact over the, the system response. Uh, two, three specific, uh, two specific parameters stand out, which is the intri intrinsic permeability which has the most impact over the soil saturation, uh, particularly as depth increases and the influence of boundary conditions is lower. And then we have the soil water retention curve parameters, which uh, increment, uh, increase or decrease the, the volumetric water content of the soil, which in turn has a visual impact on the soil temperature. Just to close up this first topic, a few conclusions. We first have that we've used a wide range of atmospheric conditions. Uh, three of the four uh, conditions didn't have uh, uh, practical maximum values over 30 degrees. This number, 30 degrees, is relevant because it's a superior boundary that's used in most common design codes as the, the temperature value over which uh, special conditions must be uh, analyzed and taken care of. Uh, temperature fluctuations uh, were within the first two to three meters of the soil mass, which is uh, in agreement with the uh, past literature results. And um, mean in soil values were close to the yearly mean value, which also is in agreement with what is depicted in guidelines such, a, such as the AFSTO. Um, for scenario, scenarios in which the soil mass was exposed, with three of them, we had a constant relative humidity value of 100%. But when, with, when this soil mass was uh, protected either by impermeable layers or draining layers, we could reduce this value to uh, fluctuations between 70 and 100%, which could be uh, favorable for the long-term response of uh, geosynthetic materials. Now, on to the particular modeling of uh, polymeric materials. Our focus is on PET strut reinforcements, from which I have a sample here. This material is composed of polyester fibers, of PET, which act as a structural component. And this bundle of fibers are covered in a polyethylene sheet or uh, other uh, geosynthetic, which serves as uh, protection for either installation damage or, or chemical weathering or, or other um, effects that could be detrimental to the long-term uh, behavior of the polymer fibers. So this type of uh, materials can have, depending on the density of the fibers, can have uh, ultimate tensile strengths from ranging from 20 kilonewtons per strap up to over 100 kilonewtons per strap. And as I said at the beginning, there are several partial factors that must be accounted for usually in an over-conservative way, uh, to determine the allowable strength of these uh, elements in a design phase. For this, they consider we consider creep, we consider installation damage, uh, weathering due to UV, UV light, and the chemical degradations of the fibers due to, for example, hydrolysis. Creep and chemical degradation are the partial factors of main interest for my research, and it's uh, what we're focused, especially on creep. So, um, geosynthetic materials are rate dependent, and polyester is no exception to that. This means that for different load scenarios, for different uh, time frames, or for different temperatures, the response will vary, either uh, both the short-term response and the long-term response. 
Uh, typical design methodologies uh, for this type of materials include the selection of a single stiffness value. This stiffness value is uh, derived from the isochronous uh, stiffness strain curves and should incorporate the, the, the long-term degradation of this. To obtain this, uh, you begin with laboratory measured data, which are creep curves. This is the rate, the accumulated strain over time for different constant loads from which we can obtain uh, isochronous or different time um, stress strain curves, which in hand allows us, to, allows us to obtain stiffness strain isochronous curves. Based on the stiffness strain isochronous curve, we could select a value. For example, a commonly accepted value is uh, the stiffness at 2% strain and 1,000 hours. Uh, the 2% strain is based on the observed maximum strains of this type of, of reinforcer walls. And the thousand hours is based on the time that it's usually taken to complete this type of structures. Um, with this stiffness value, we, uh, which is usually called the creep reduced stiffness, we go back into any design methodology, be it analytical or, or numerical, and um, calculate our requirements. Uh, within polymer materials, we have two results which are relevant. First is the short-term results obtained from constant rate of strength uh, tests. And then we have the uh, creep curves or the long-term results, which is our focus. For the constant rate of strain, uh, we obtain the ultimate tensile strain of the material. And uh, we can see here that there's a slight sort of S shape that will be more or less pronounced depending on the polymeric material. Um, regarding the creep curves, as I already told, uh, said, it's uh, the strain evolution over time under constant load. And these type of structures are usually designed for 80 to 100 to 120 years, meaning that if we wanted to evaluate creep for 100 years, we had to have a sample hanging at a constant load for 100 years, which is not possible, not being practical. For this, the, it's, uh, what's usually done is using the temperature superposition method or the stiff isothermal method in which uh, several uh, samples are subjected to the same load level at different temperatures, which allows it to obtain several strain, strain time curves, which in a basic way are basically superimposed onto each other and gives us a, a final creep master curve for uh, 10, 20, 100 years. In the case of PET in particular, uh, the long-term response in creep is characterized by a primary creep, an uh, extended primary creep phase, which means that there is an extended period in which the rate of strain decreases, followed by a brief uh, secondary or tertiary creep phase uh, before rupture. Secondary creep implies a constant rate of strain over time. And uh, tertiary creep imp implies an acceler accelerated rate of strain over time. Regarding the stiffness of these materials, uh, we can see that it's clearly nonlinear, be it for one hour or the dots on the second figure for several exochronous times. And it only starts behaving in a linear manner after four, from, from four to five percent of strain. This could resolve troublesome since I just mentioned the service conditions of reinforcer walls usually falls under or 2% or even under 1%, which uh, could make the characterization of the type, this type of materials somewhat troublesome. So with that in mind, we aim to model the long-term response of the type of materials using uh, finite element methods, particularly using cold dried and uh, GID. And we have ample uh, data sets of different manufacturers of different load conditions and the different grades or ultimate tensile strengths of PET straps, from which to, to, uh, to the or 3D requirements of the model we, we want to achieve. Uh, we've done several combinations of different constitutive models to uh, reproduce this behavior. 
including, including several variations of elastic models and several uh, combinations of viscous models, be it viscoelastic or viscoplastic. With these models, we've worked a lot, we've calibrated a lot of parameters, and we've reached certain curves uh, which are depicted by the, uh, the color lines in the figure that match the laboratory results in certain points, uh, certain relevant points, for example, a thousand hours or rupture, which are of interest, but the trajectory of the strains don't really match. We have this, in this case, model three, it's, uh, it's a combination of two viscoplastic models. So we have two constant viscosities, which result in the in a clear uh, S-shaped behavior attributed to uh, the first uh, viscosity uh, starting to uh, starting to take effect, followed by the second viscosity that starts to take effect. So with each iteration and combination of constitutive model we've analyzed, we've improved the results, uh, but we've also increased the number of parameters which makes all comparison and calibrations more cumbersome. All of these curves were calibrated for each curve, respectively. And what we want to achieve is uh, either a product-specific combination of parameters or a material-specific combination of parameters, again, with the least amount of parameters we, we can have. So with that in mind, we are working on a new proposal of a new viscoplastic uh, constitutive law, which includes two viscosities, one to account for primary creep and one to account for secondary creep. The primary creep, it's, uh, um, it's dependent on the total elastic uh, viscoplastic strains, which uh, decreases over time. And then we have a constant viscosity, which accounts for secondary creep. Uh, again, as I emphasized on the first segment, we require temperatures and either saturation or relative humidity dependencies to properly reproduce the behavior of this uh, material. In this case, uh, for this formulation, we jumped down from, I believe, 10 parameters from the previous iterations to only five in this case, which is our aim to model in a practical way the long response of, the, of this material. Just by looking at one creep curve, which in this case it's at 60% of load for this type of reinforcement. We can see right away that we've uh, greatly improved the tra trajectory uh, without losing accuracy throughout the points. And if we see, if we compare the, if we plot the new model, the new constitutive model with the measurements, uh, we can tell right away that both the intermediate measurements and the trajectory of the overall strains are reproduced in, a, in an improved manner. Also, what we couldn't achieve with the previous model of generalizing the parameters for a product-specific uh, generalization, uh, we've been able to do so in here using uh, power law approximations for each parameter, for each fluidity value, uh, which, again, uh, allows, it, allows us to introduce as general uh, model into a full height before soil wall, uh, which is what we're currently working right now uh, in order to compare the long-term performance of the wall, uh, particularly of creep, uh, considering different temperatures and, and atmospheric conditions. And uh, well, this is an ongoing work, part of my PhD thesis. So I hope you enjoyed it and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Well, I don't know if there are any comments or in the room or even in the chat. I think I can open it. Well, sorry, I arrived a little bit late, but it was about being a visit, but. I saw that you were saying that uh, relative humidity um, is a variable that is important for that, and I agree with this. But it's hundred percent when 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 the medium is uh, at, at saturation bigger than 
zero, so it's uh, wet. But that's okay, it's wet, but but that, that doesn't mean exactly it's 100%, or I didn't catch this idea, that 100% of the humidity, the material is, uh, is uh, 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 saturation bigger than. Right, that's, that's yeah, I, I think you just missed that part that I said that any saturation, any non-zero saturation, will imply a 100% relative humidity in the material. So we yeah. have 1% of saturation, I'll have, actually it's like 99.99995 relative humidity in, in the material. So uh, usually- Is it for, for full saturation? Like the, the material is not yet saturated, it has a certain saturation level. But uh, the relative humidity is only 100 percent. Uh, did you compare your results with, uh, with I mean, the geometry without uh, uh, this material, only soil? Uh, yeah, be before I mean, actually, this like the all of these results consider this. This mesh, which doesn't include all of the structural components that I, I showed at the first uh, segment, since we're just doing, in this case, thermohydraulic uh, modeling, we don't need the reinforcement layers. And the reinforcement layers, since there are discontinuous elements, uh, for example, they don't block the drainage within the soil. So uh, it, it's it's good enough to consider a homogeneous media without considering the reinforcements in between. Mm -hmm. On the strain and the stress, for example, we see how much strain and the stress we have without this material and with this material. I mean, these usually are vertical walls, so if you don't have the material, you can have the vertical wall. Because the, the, the actual reinforcement, it's it's taking up the stress for the wall to. Without that, we have failure. Right. We have one, one curiosity. In terms of solvers, we are, we are speaking about different physics to be solved mm -hmm. and to be coupled between themselves. Those solvers, are they monolithic or do you solve them in a separate way, like staggered and then exchange information? Or This is a really a detail of the solver. Yeah, but I mean, uh, for these uh, simulations, it's, a, it's a, a staggered, so it solves everything at once. Yeah, but the system of equations is unique. It's monolithical. Monolithic. 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 Okay. So normally we solve the, the PHM model in a monolithical way. So we solve the coupling. We have not investigated the case of the Steiger effect. But in, in many years, but in principle, we assume that uh, monolithical is, uh, is robust. Oh, but, uh, yeah, but there is always this. Uh, it can be a very problem dependent. And, and, and since we are solving THM, including also chemistry, in, in many cases, for instance, this is a very nice application in this field, but code right is used for different things with different types of couplings. Uh, and, and it's true that here, sometimes we think that maybe temperature can be. It's targeted from the others, but uh, it depends on the problem. So, yeah. If you have convection, then it's not convenient. In general, in general this solver solves uh, one thing. And uh, maybe we can close the session. And thank you again, Anibal, for your really nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.